yes, this is a commercial environment. Yes, it's a commercial show, but let's face it. There's a lot of things that are building within the drone industry and the drone recreational side and a lot of crossover. So let's talk drone racing with a name at this point that has become literally synonymous with the concept, multi-GP. Chris Thomas, sure. Uh, are, you, are you ready to race? Absolutely. You know, um, drones have a lot of applications. Uh, the key to drones is they become unmanned. You remove the human from the pilot seat. Well, most of the jobs that they're talking about here, uh, frankly, are boring. You go up, you go down, you look at stuff. Uh, we found a lot uh, more fun way to apply unmanned technology. You know, drone racing is a, is a very fast-growing sport. Uh, by, by putting yourself in the pilot seat of a drone, you get all the fun of, of flying a jet fighter with none of the risk of crashing a jet fighter. For those of us flown jet fighters, yay. Uh, <laughs> especially for those of us who have looked at the little handle a couple of times and wondered if it was time to pull. We saw you at work at Seabrook. Right. Uh, spent some time in the pit, spent some time uh, all over that area. And the thing to me that was interesting from my first opportunity to really get in the middle of it and spend a considerable period of time with it was, holy smokes, this is cool. Yeah. Um, I mean, I'm a... a, a I come from all aspects of aviation, helicopter, jets, airplanes, gliders, aerobatics, the whole nine yards, something like about 19,000 hours now, and it, wow. I'm not an easy guy to impress. This was cool stuff. Cool. I mean, I wanted to get out there and, and, and just go out and go nuts, yeah. and it was obvious from everybody who walked through there that there was a strong urge to participate, right. which to me seems to indicate you got something going here. Tell me how a race is conducted, and more important, what's the future of the concept right now? Well, I get asked uh, that question, you know, what's the future? Uh, but as far as the race is concerned, uh, we are using some state-of-the-art technology and some antiquated technology. The old technology we like to use is analog video transmission. We do it because it's extremely low latency, and it's extremely and it works. light, it works, and it's inexpensive. The drones that we build are typically four to 500 grams. They're very lightweight. They're designed to be super fast, very agile, uh, but also be able to withstand a crash. So if we put high dollar video transmission technology and we break it every crash, suddenly no we've point. made it a very expensive yeah. sport. No point. So a typical race will consist of uh, anywhere from five to eight drones. We put them out on the, on the starting line. We verify that every pilot has got a good radio link, a good video link. Once it's been verified, the race starts. It typically lasts for about two minutes. The courses are designed to test the speed, the agility, the skill of the pilot to make sure that they are you know, the best of the best. We want to use this as a way to find out who is the best pilot. Um, while you're in the pilot seat, when you're racing, you forget everything. You, you start off nervous, holding onto a remote control with a weird pair of goggles on your face. And the next thing you know, you're a machine. And mm -hmm. you spend two minutes as this machine racing around a course, every bit of your available processing power in your brain is operating this aircraft. It's, it's awesome. The thing that was interesting to me was you had two visual modes for spectators. Right. You had the screen where you saw what each of the FPV goggles was showing its pilot. Right. And in this case, let's, let's, let's uh, make one thing very clear. Uh, the guys flying, the guys and girls flying this, our pilots, right? Nope. This is highly, uh, this is high speed, fine tuned, highly coordinated, and you've got to know what you're, what you're doing. Otherwise, you get that inevitable little thunk <laughs> that we heard quite a yeah. few times at Seabrook. Yeah. Uh, so that was exciting. And then there was just standing, and in, in some cases standing in the pit area, which of course was shielded by netting and so forth, and kept everybody safe. But you're in the middle as these uh, machines are whizzing around at. at seemingly high rates of speed, or at least relative to the people standing in the middle, and it's incredibly entertaining. Right. And I would imagine this scales really well. Well, it does. Uh, as it scales in size, of course, it scales in cost. One of the things we love about the sport right now is it's very accessible. It's something that anyone can participate in. And you're Not, doing races all over the place. Yeah, there was uh, 456 races last month. So it's what do you growing. do in your spare time? <laughs> we do racing. <laughs> this is what we do. This yeah, is yeah. way beyond a job. This is more of uh, just a, a mission in life. We are spreading this new sport 
We're helping to grow a new sport. We're inspiring a whole new generation of aviators. These are people who never knew that they liked flying. Maybe they've looked at an airplane and said, that's neat, and they go back to playing their video games. But we're building this whole new generation uh, of pilots. Now, the other part that's kind of interesting for the crass commercial side of all of this is you can make some money off of this. And well, it's got tremendous potential to make a whole lot more. You know, um, we look forward to the day when pilots are, are celebrities, they're well paid, they're well taken care of. There are a few pilots who've already made that jump, who've gone from this being their hobby to this being their full-time career. And we've seen some pretty amazing prize purses. Uh, Dubai put on a race with a million dollar prize purse for drone racing. Which for I am in the wrong business. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's a lot of pilots and there's only one prize purse. So it doesn't go that far when it, you know, when it comes down to the pilots. We believe there will is, is a great future here. This is a potential branding platform for these companies that are here at this show to prove that they're the best mm -hmm. of the best. The disconnect that I see right now in the, in the UAV industry and in the early days of aviation is in the early days of aviation, to be a test pilot, you had to be able to fly things that other people couldn't fly so you would survive. The, the herd was thin based on pilot skill. Right now in the UAV industry, there are many pilots out here that there's not been a test of their skill. Not to say that they're bad pilots, but what test has been performed? They've not been in that scenario. If they're flying uh, automated systems that go up because the computer go, tells it to go up, they may not be the best suited for, for flying these aircraft. Mm -hmm. So we've built a system, I think, that finds the best pilots in the world. Uh, they're fully manual. There are no computer controls in these aircraft. It is a human operating an aircraft, and that's it. Pretty exciting stuff. Uh, at Sebring, I'm, if I'm, I'm trying to recall, what were the purses at Sebring? So at that, that prize, there was 15000 total right. that was paid go. out to the pilots. And what was amazing for us is the FAA, uh, the local rep from the FISDO, was right there beside us. Mm -hmm. There was an operating air show. Uh, next to oh, yeah. us, and um, everything was safe, everything was controlled, uh, everything met and exceeded the expectations that the FAA inspectors had for yeah. being there. So for us, that was a monumental point in this brand well, new Well, what sport. was interesting is you not only fit in, it wasn't a situation where they had to throw you out in the lower 40 and the only way to get out there was to take a tram or whatever the case may be. You were in the middle center complex, right. just tucked off to one side. Uh, and we could walk from where we were launching and recovering and all the LSAs and doing the demo flights and the flybys and everything else and be in the middle of drone territory in like two minutes. Yeah. And it fit really well. Right. It was fun to walk from one to the other and aviation, general aviation, sport aviation tends to be filled with folks who are fairly conservative. Right. But I listen to a lot of folks come back from there going, that was cool. <laughs> and I can get one of those for a couple hundred bucks. Yeah. yeah. Uh, you know, where's a hobby shop? We were telling people where, where Graves was in Orlando right. and a few other places and right, kind of go, right. yeah, we got to go see this stuff. Sure. It, it has the potential to be one, exciting and fun and recreational from a number of standpoints. Two, there's the competitive aspect where people could actually uh, make a few bucks and so forth and so on. But the part that is exciting to me is what it can do to bridge the gap again between you know big dark scary aviation and the general public who thinks drones are out to ram grandma's airliner so she right. can't come home for thanksgiving yeah uh, it's it's just such a great crossover it's exciting it's new it's it's just a phenomenal bridge right you know we we just uh partnered with purdue to run the first college championship mm -hmm. uh, we per covered that on uh airborne uh, on the game of drone report the other day yeah and what was really exciting about that, Purdue has a, a, a great model for their students. A lot of the equipment that you don't fly, the ground stations, the controllers, the goggles, they rent this to their, their students, or they check it out like a library, mm -hmm. which is helping these, these new aviators to get involved. But seeing that competitiveness between the colleges uh, is something that excites us. It, it helps to, to drive this to being uh, a, a sport. Chris, if somebody is interested in getting involved in this, what's the, what is the step up? How, do they, how does somebody who got himself a Phantom 3 under the tree last year now figure out how to do something far more exciting than chase the neighbor's cat? Sure. 
Well, um, if you visit our website, multigp.com, you can find a chapter in your area. These are a group of UAV enthusiasts. Some of them race, mm -hmm. some of them do photography, but all of them are like-minded and they really can help anyone who's interested to in getting further into the sport you know, with advice on equipment or how to configure it or run it or even just learning how to fly. So there's chapters, uh, there's over a thousand chapters now around the world of MultiGP. Holy smokes. Uh, do you have any idea about how large the community overall uh, pilot is? We've, we've talked about this a lot. We have um, over 17,000 registered pilots, which we would imagine makes up about a third of the yeah. overall world's community. That's so nearly 60,000 uh, drone racers and growing very fast. And again, and I realize it puts you on the spot, but then again, that's my job and you're in the hot seat. <laughs> Where do you go from here? You know, um, what we're looking for is a lot of races, high frequency of races. Uh, the days of, of making this, these pilgrims from where you live to a place far away for a one-time event has changed. We live in more of that instant gratification world. So we, we, we have these series that go on right now. Our championship this year is 100 races that lead up to a final. Mm -hmm. which we're going to be holding the finals at a, a, a pillar in the aviation uh, community for racing. Uh, we'll be announcing that in the next couple of days. But building that... See, a pillar in aviation for racing. Yeah, that's, that's a one four, four letter. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah, got it. You got it. Been there many uh, a year. <laughs> well, we're excited about that. The amazing part about it, though, is you're finding talent that has never been discovered. You know, we'll have a 12-year-old make it to the finals to, to race against the Sean Taylor who is, you know, in his 30s, right? But we're not so concerned. This levels the playing field. So just seeing the frequency of racing grow throughout the world brings a, an awareness and makes it hopefully a household sport. Well, I gotta tell you, I'm, I'm excited for what you're doing. It's something we've covered uh, quite a bit, not just because it's news, but because it's good for the industry. Anything that popularizes, provides a good structure, builds a community, and most important, provides a very favorable, positive viewpoint to the rest of the world. So once again, the drone becomes something that is cool rather than suspicious. Yeah. That's something that's gotta be good for us all. And I thank you for the work. Well, thanks. Alrighty, guy. Aero News Network's coverage of the Association for Unmanned Vehicle Systems International's Exponential 2017, live from Dallas, Texas, is brought to you in part by the following sponsors. Let Patrick Neal and Associates provide the legal expertise needed to navigate the commercial UAS industry. Whether it be waivers, exemptions, operational plans, or other issues, we can provide the guidance you need to keep flying and building your successful UAS operation www.droneattorneys.us In collaboration with NASC, introducing Sonics Aerospace, bringing you the Taros Group 4 UAS, the redesigned Tiger Shark Block 4, and the Subsonics Twin Jet UAS, all derived from flight-proven manned systems, not concepts, real aircraft. More at sonicsaerospace.com Continental Motors Group. Manned and unmanned, Continental has been a pivotal part of aviation and aerospace history and wants to be a part of your mission. Gas or diesel, certified or experimental, Continental is investing in your future. www.continentalmotors.aero